You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Used to be an addict, now he's substance free. Telling all about his crazy journey. Take off that mask and take on your addiction. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, and the host of The Alan Charles Show, is here to bring hope to the hopeless as he shares his unbelievable luck at surviving a 24 year drug addiction. Alan's raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. So now, please welcome the host of The Alan Charles Show, Alan Charles. He's given us the real story, The Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, The Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory. The Alan Charles Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Alan Charles Show, coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. On Thursday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you have entered the No Stigma Zone. And this No Stigma Zone deals with addictions and it deals with recovery and it deals with reality and for those of you that are coming back thank you very much for coming back to listen and those of you that are new to my show as I just shared we talk about recovery addiction and reality and there are all kinds of addiction you know obviously we know about drugs and alcohol because those are the most talked about but then there are sex and there's eating and there's shopping and and the list goes on and on about things that we can possibly get addicted to now one of the things that we talk about all the time and that we've learned is that these addictions that jump up and get us out of ourselves so we deal with you know regular human feelings so we deal with depression we deal with anxiety we deal with fear we deal with not being good enough uh, so the way you grow up obviously affects the way you're going to perceive life and the things that you're going to do and how you're going to handle it. And so the primary things that are going on are all of those things I just spoke about. So what happens when you're depressed or you're upset or you feel less than or you don't belong or you have a gender problem, whatever it's going on that you're thinking about. You just want to feel better. You don't want, who wants to feel depressed, filled with anxiety, and just basically feel like crap? Nobody wants to live that way. So you know what happens? These little things that we do are very pleasurable, and they take us out of thinking about all those other things that we have problems with. Now, one of the things that you need to remember is it's a distraction. It starts out and it's a good thing. It's great. I can go eat out and I love this place and I'm going to reward myself or make myself feel better because I had a crappy day. So you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to have this awesome Italian meal and I am going to have I love their Italian bread and I am going to have something that contains a lot of carbs maybe some pasta dish for an appetizer and then I'll have cheese and I'll have spaghetti and manicotti and I can just go and go and go so I, I totally get it so 
these things take us out of ourselves. They become pleasurable in the beginning and they work in the beginning. And then eventually it stops working. And for me, that escape was it started out with baseball. Then it was harness racing where I was able to add a gambling component to it. So more than a spectator and wanting to drive racehorses, which I eventually did, I became addicted to the gambling and the excitement and the adrenaline rush. And, uh, you know, those are so many things that can happen to us out there. It doesn't mean we're a bad person. It doesn't mean that we are doing things bad or we're irresponsible. Uh, those things are all a part of addiction. But Addiction is a disease and it turns your brain chemistry. And as I shared, we will get somebody on from Mount Sinai Hospital um, as I am on the board working with them which on a study of brain change with cocaine. And um, I've uh, done some studies with them before they've helped me with something, a uh, program that I'm working on. And uh, so we're going to have a guest come on and talk to us about the difference of the brain image and what the brain chemistry does when it encounters different drugs or different alcohols or substances because all the different substances do different things to the brain. But once that brain starts to change, that's where the addiction sets in and that's where we run into problems. So that's why we're here because we want to help. I've been through it. I'm a living example that you can get through this no matter how far you have fallen. I was on the bottom of the barrel. I had nothing left. I lost everything. During my 24-year cocaine addiction, I lost jobs, money, houses, apartment, two wives, children, dogs. I lost everything. Every single thing by the time I was done with my addiction, and that's what it cost me. And so I am here to tell you that there is hope and there is recovery, and we do recover and we do get better. And I am here to give you that hope. So what we're going to do today, because talking about addiction is kind of a dark subject. Uh, <laughs> You know, we, we hear all the studies, uh, we talk about that 2,000 people a day, approximately, die in the United States. That's 70,000 people will die from overdose addiction, and it's horrendous, and a lot of these deaths can be prevented, and we're here to help. So, you have that piece of it, but on the other side... Us that are in the program, we tend to laugh at certain things. So, you know, from the outside, it might not sound funny, but there are some crazy things that happen in addiction that are actually funny. Uh, we do things when we're inebriated or when we're wired or, you know, who knows? Some are funny. Some are funny, sad, some are horrendous, some are disgusting. So there's, there's numerous ways to describe what you do when you're out there. But you know what? If it wasn't fun at some point or there wasn't excitement or adrenaline, um, if you didn't have uh, the euphoria, then there would be no reason to ever do these things. So there, it absolutely worked for the longest time and unfortunately for me that's why I kept going because it kept working and it kept working and it kept working and I was having a good time there were consequences and they started to add up at the end and that eventually what brought me to my knees is I, I lost I had to lose everything to be able to get back up find recovery and then be able to go on this journey that I am on, that I am sharing with everybody out there, because it is important to me to open up and to let you see what's going on on the inside. This really is the ultimate special invite for 
VIPs to get an inside look at what it is like to go through addiction, to live it. What goes on through your brain? What are you thinking? How does it affect you? I will give you all of that information and share it with you on future shows. You can ask me anything. I'm an open book. And when we come back, I will share with you this incredible story about smuggling cocaine from Miami. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We will be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ouvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I was sharing both a little bit about how I got here and what I plan to do as far as opening up and giving you, our audience, the true real story of what goes on out there behind the mask. What goes on? in the mind of somebody that is an addict, that drinks, that drugs, that uses substances, what goes on in the mind of that person? Well, I can tell you all about that. So that's what we were talking about. And then I want to share with you the theme of the show today is to talk about things that you can't believe you did while you're out there. And we'll be talking the whole show. I'd be happy to take calls if you wanted to share about something crazy you did out there while you were using or drunk or eating or, you know, whatever addiction you're dealing with. The call in number is 866 451 1451. Again, that's 866 451 1451. And you can also email me questions. My email address is Alan, A L A N at the Alan Charles Show dot com. So let's get in to my smuggling cocaine from Miami. It's it's a long story. I will cut it down so that I am able to share it in the remaining time that we have and also take questions and things like that. But you know what? There was excitement and there was adventure in my life. I'm not recommending or saying that I did right things. I don't stand behind what I did. I know a lot of the things I did in addiction were wrong, were illegal. Um, Fortunately, 
I had minimal damage because of my addiction. Well, minimal damage is when you lose everything in your whole life for 24 years. I don't know if you can say that's minimal damage. So let me let me clarify that. I, I've had a lot of horrific things happen, but as far as the law and things like that, I've been very fortunate and I've had minimal damage going reflecting that so let's let's get into it so here i am in my addiction um i don't know maybe i'm going at it for a couple of months now i'm 24 turning 25 years old and doing coke for the first time with a friend that was a dealer and he started to run out of cocaine i don't know i went from moving in with him and then helping him do everything to snorting every single day. Uh, I started a new job. I was living up in Connecticut. Um, I actually called in sick the first day because I spent the entire weekend when I moved in doing cocaine. And it was literally right in the beginning of when I started. And that first month, I probably... If I got 15 hours of sleep for the entire month, that was a lot. Uh, it, It was just craziness and part of it was fun Uh, I don't know any other way to say it that I was having a blast I was becoming popular or more popular Joe had people coming in and out of the house all the times of the day and so I learned how to cook it we were selling that and uh, you know I was just his assistant uh, you know, he was giving me coke. He was very generous. Um, so I, uh, I had free use of the stuff in the house. And then I don't know if we started doing too much or if there there was a shortage because somehow I got thrown into being the person that goes to the down to Westchester. And we were living up in Sherman, Connecticut. So from Sherman, Connecticut, which is part of I don't know if that's Litchfield County or borderline of Litchfield and Fairfield County. So it's about 45 minutes to an hour from Washington Heights where I would go down to pick up my cocaine. But uh, I was living up in Sherman and uh, when his connection couldn't bring him back more cocaine and we started to run low, he found a guy down in the Thornwood, New York area. So that was kind of on my way down towards Washington Heights where I went when I wanted Coke and nobody had. So I was introduced to this person and he became our supplier. And I would, every time Joe needed something, I would run down, I would get down to Thornwood, meet the guy, pick up an ounce or two and come back and I would always open it up I was always I would always take a little bit for myself I'd be messed up driving those are you know things I I look back at and I cringe at um so as I was so now I become the official uh cocaine purchaser or smuggler or whatever title you want to give that ridiculous stupid decision I made to 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 help him with that but I was getting free cocaine so you know you do what you need to do and this just shows you the level of where my head was at during my addiction because you you don't think normally you don't have a conscious thought of what you're doing or what the consequences are. At the time, I was 20-something, 24, 25, 26 years old. I was working, started working at a rock station, living at this guy's house with a dealer, and I was partying nonstop, and it was fun. So eventually it stops becoming fun, but, but not at this point. So now... Our guy in Thornwood ran out of supply. And I'm like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And then Joe came up with an idea. He said, listen, I I have some contacts down in Miami. Let me make a few phone calls. So he calls a couple of people. One thing leads to another. And he gets connected to this guy. I don't remember what I called him in the book, but uh, let's call him Chucky. So I got connected to Chucky down in Miami. And... I don't know if any of you remember this, but there, um, and I'm going back a while ago. This has to be like 1985, 86, I'm guessing. 
And there was an airline called People's Express. And People's Express, one of the airports they ran from locally here in the New York area, I think it was the only one they ran out of, was at Newark Airport. So the way it worked with People Express is you can just show up there and book, go right onto the plane. The seat, if the seat is open, you sit down, they come and run a credit card, boom, 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 and you're on your way to Miami. And so that was pretty cool. Joe gave me his credit card and he said, you need to go down. So I went to People's Express. I got down to Miami and my intention was to get down there, get an, I don't know, an ounce or two and then come right back. Well, there was a bunch of adventures that happened while I was down there. And when we come back from break, I'm going to tell you all about the adventures down in Miami and how long it took me to get back to New York. You are listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And you don't want to miss this story. We'll be right back. Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the realization of your dreams by making them a reality. Based in Quebec, Canada, Joanne is also a space coach using social media and Skype to work with anyone, anywhere around the world. Contact Joanne Charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca 819-360-3266 Now is your time. Essential Nutrients, LLC, is the brainchild of entrepreneur Barbara Burns. Inspired by a desire to help others, Barbara worked with a team of scientists to develop unique nutritional liquid supplements with the goal to improve the quality of your life. Glucosamine, zinc, and calcium are essential to well-being, and this is the focus of Essential Nutrients, LLC. Whether you're a professional athlete, weekend warrior, student, business owner, or homemaker, Essential Nutrients offers products for everyone, including the family pet. And they're easy to take, no pills. Health requires commitment, exercise, a good diet, proper supplementation, and action. So take action today and get your supply of essential liquid nutrients by visiting www.essential-liquids.com. Don't put off your health any longer. Take essential products today and start to measure the difference. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and I'm your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I was telling you about this wild story where I now am down in Miami after flying down on People's Express, and for those of you out there, People Express is an old uh, airlines that you used to just show up at the gate, get on the plane, and if there was a seat, you would take out your credit card, and the seat was yours. And so I felt like a big shot. Joe gave me his credit card. I ran down to Newark Airport, and off I went to Miami. So I am excited because I I didn't know exactly how it was going to work. I knew that uh, Chucky was going to be picking me up at the airport. And I just assumed we'd go get the stuff, give it to me, and I'd turn around and, you know, in an hour or so, I would be back on a People's Express plane back to uh, to Newark Airport. But that didn't happen. Here's what happened. And, of course, something crazy happened because that's what happens when you are going through addiction and you're living your life and you, you're acting 
uh, I don't know the best way to say it. I want to say you're you're act you're not acting normal, but you know what is normal. And when you go into this addiction, your brain is only telling you that you want to use. And I guess as somebody here, I am in my middle to late twenties, or yeah, middle twenties. Um, you know, I'm in good shape. I'm healthy, and all this stuff is just crazy fun to me. I, I'm I, and I. I I grew up with good morals and I, I always tried to do the right thing and I was conscientious and I, I was a good kid and a nice person. So realizing that I was doing all this stuff, I didn't want to think about it because it was so against the grain of what I at least perceived myself to be that I, I didn't even notice other person that was doing all these crazy things. I mean, I never would have done drugs. In my mind, I would have never done drugs. And, you know, unfortunately, and I've shared, you know, there was a, t I didn't do cocaine and it's a whole nother long story. Um, but uh, I didn't try cocaine until I was 24 years old. Now, I should tell you, this story, as well as others, are, you can find them in my book called Walking Out the Other Side, An Addict's Journey from Loneliness to Life. If you Google Walking Out the Other Side... It, my book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the bookstores online, and I go into detail, and there's story after story. My life has been an adventure. I've been very fortunate. I played professional baseball in the Dominican Republic. I was a professional and still am a professional harness racing driver. Uh, my favorite singer in the world is Barry Manilow, and I got to sing with him at Radio City Music Hall. Um I can't say enough of the wonderful things. I got two incredible, beautiful daughters. Uh, so I, I have gotten a lot of things out of life, but I've also lost a lot of things. And everything that I've lost was directly related to this addiction. So let's go back to the story. I'm in Miami. Chucky picks me up from the airport. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning. And he says, we have a little problem. Hmm. So we have a little problem. OK, so. Oh, and then and he also brought his girlfriend with him to pick me up. Now, this girl was ridiculously gorgeous. She was just beautiful. On top of that, um, he'd mentioned she was from Cuba. And so she had like dark complexion and she had on the this skirt and a little tank top. You could see everything and uh yeah you can see everything she was flaunting it she had it and she was putting it out there and she wanted everybody to see so here we are he picks me up the airport tells me we have a problem and the dealer's probably not going to get the stuff till tomorrow so now we have a full day in miami what am i going to do so chucky comes back i won't say his real name chucky comes back and uh, says, hey, why don't we go out to this bar? We'll grab a couple of drinks. We'll hang out, waste some time, and then we'll go from there. So he stops. I don't know. We're, we're heading towards his apartment, and we're in not a real good part of town. And then the bars, uh, it just it was, it was a kind of a seedy, rundown area. And we went into this Cuban bar, and it's 11 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. So I don't know if some of these people were still there from the, the evening before, but there must have been about seven or eight men, older men, and they're all drinking. And you can see how sloshed some of them were hanging out of their seat and bent over. And a couple of other were like barely making sense. You can hear them talk and they're just babbling. So we go in, we go to the bar and we sit down and Chucky's girlfriend jumps up on the bar with her skirt and sits down with her legs hanging off the bar, but facing out towards everybody. And now, one by one, all these men that are there drinking are getting up, either going to the bathroom or doing something. But they're making sure that they come by to take a look at Chucky's hot girlfriend. So 
she starts flirting with them and they're all guy they're older guys so you know she she starts flirting with them and they you know they're they're being funny and they know there's they see two guys there and you know they're assuming one of them is her boyfriend so they were joking they said a couple of things and then she said why don't you come sit down talk <laughs> so a couple of them come over and talk and they're laughing and you know, just general chit chat. And, um, you know, like it was a Cuban bar. So they, they were talking about Cuba and one thing led to another. And the next thing I saw one of these guys that was totally wasted, he had asked Chucky's girlfriend a question, laughed at the answer and then put his hand on her leg. Now she had the short skirt on. So, you know, he's touching her skin, her thigh. And I look over at Chucky and he is fuming. He is bright red. And I don't know him well enough to, to know what to do. But to me, it looks like, oh no, all hell is going to break loose. And from that point, I just watched, I tried to talk to Chucky and I said, hey, just take calm down. When we come back from break, I'm going to let you know what happened. And I can tell you that a melee ensued. You don't want to miss this story. You are listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And we will be right back. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show. We're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio from New York City. And I am your host, Alan Charles. And I really appreciate you being here. You're tuned in to the No Stigma Zone. And there is no stigma around any addiction here on the Alan Charles Show. We talk about it every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, about drugs, alcohol, addictions, and recovery. And we talk about reality here. We, we give the real story. This is what's going on out there. So before the break, let's get back to my smuggling cocaine story from Miami. So here I am. I land in Miami, and Chucky and his girlfriend pick me up. We go to a bar. He tells me it's 11 o'clock in the morning in Miami, and he tells me that the dealer's not going to be able to get anything until tomorrow, so I'm going to have to stay over. So now we have a day to spend in Miami and kill some time, and Chucky takes myself, his girlfriend, and I to a bar in a seedy, seedy area of town, and it was a Cuban bar. And uh, Chucky's girlfriend used to is used to is Cuban. So here she is. She's perched up on the uh, bar with her legs facing out. So you can actually see up her dress and see her pink underwear. I mean, she was flaunting it and flirting. And Chris started when somebody one of the guys in the bar, an older man, came over and was talking because she invited him. He put his hand on her bare thigh and Chris's eyes lit up and I to myself was like, oh, no, here we go. So Chris is boiling. He told the guy to get his hand off of his girlfriend and screamed at him. And the guy was so drunk 
And he looked up and he goes, what are you going to do? And I was like, oh, no, that was not the right question or answer. And all of a sudden, Chris, one shot, guy drops to his knees. Just, oh, what a punch. And then all of a sudden, two guys from the other side of the bar are running over. And they both jump on Chris. So here I am. And I mean, this is, it's all happening in the spur of the moment. But I remember having these thoughts in my head and I'm saying to myself, here I am. I got to jump in. I got to help this guy. But I've never been in like an all out barroom brawl. So I grab one of the guys. He hits me, but he swings and he just got my, um, my forearm. I blocked it and the guy was wasted. So I just pushed him and he basically fell over. So now Chris is working on the other guy and fighting him. And now two or three more other guys are coming over. We have our backs. We ended up with our backs back to back and we're kicking and we're fighting and we're grabbing chairs. And the thing that came out out at me is if you've ever seen Batman and Robin and they get into the fight scene and then they swing and you hear pow, bam, shazam. And that's what it was like. It was like living out this real Batman and Robin fantasy and we're beating the shit out of all these guys. Now they're all, they're older and they're messed up. So finally, there was about four or five of them sitting on there. They were on the floor. Uh, a couple other guys didn't want to come over. And the bouncer comes over. And it's a big white guy. And he goes, you assholes, get out of here now. The cops, somebody called the cops, get out of here. So he threw us out the back door. I don't know why he did that favor for us, but. The next thing you know, we went back to Chucky's house and there were cuts and some blood, not all our blood, but we had blood all over. So we kind of washed ourselves off and um, and then we just sat down and we started talking. And I'm like, you guys are so effed up. You and They were laughing when we left and we got in the car and they're going home. They started flirt. So maybe this was like a flirtation thing for them. I have no idea, but I had never been in a situation like that. And it was sick and I was messed up my own myself I had problems and I even thought that that was crazy and it was but somehow we survived it we walked out we went home and uh so we're hanging out and I don't know we had a quiet dinner that evening and now it's Sunday morning and I'm up early I'm up at 7 30 tells me the deal will be there by 9 30 and we're waiting and those last two hours seem like they went forever now here I was that I planned to smuggle this cocaine back to New York. Joe needed more cocaine to sell. We were out of supplies. And the one thing that I hadn't thought about, because maybe I think in my mind, if I didn't think about this, then the situation wasn't real. So I did not pay any attention or think about what the process would be to bring the cocaine back. I didn't know how you store it. I didn't have any luggage. So I had to have it on me. And now I started to panic. So I spoke to Chucky and I said, so how do we do this? And he says, oh, I've done it 50 times. It's not a problem. He said, what we'll do is we will tape this up on your ankle and we'll leave out enough so you can have some on the plane. And you just do a few hits as you're in the airport. That'll calm you down. And you'll just walk right onto the plane. And the way it sounded, it sounded like, hmm, that, okay, that makes sense. That's not a problem. And this is long before 9-11. So not that smuggling drugs was easy, but there wasn't all the specifications and different things in the checkpoints and, um, you know, those things have all been ramped up specifically because of terrorism, but we didn't have that then. They still did checks and, and stuff like that. And I would guess that maybe it was easier to, to get the drugs through like that, but I have no idea. All I know is he said he's taping it up on the ankle. You won't even feel it once it's on and you just walk like nothing is going on. So 
I just hope for the best. So, cocaine will be here Sunday morning, and we're going to go to a break. And you do not want to miss the rest of this story. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show. We're live in New York City on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And we will be right back. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. are back listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, we were talking about the smuggling cocaine story from Miami. And I am down in Miami. It's Sunday morning. And I am waiting for the cocaine to be delivered. And it's two hours before the shipment is coming in. And I am, for the first time, starting to think about, hmm, how am I going to do this? And now I'm starting to panic. So I spoke to Chucky. Chucky tells me he's done it 50, 70 times. I don't know what he said, something like that. And that it's not a problem. He tapes it up. He leaves some out for me on to do on the plane, to do before the plane, and everything will be okay. So that. It sounded like a plan to me. So I just left it up to him and and had faith. And, and that's what happened. Shipment showed up. I got an ounce. He taped it to my leg. We left out some to use. And then he dropped me off at the, at the airport. So now, hmm, Sunday afternoon, it's about, I think the next plane was leaving at four o'clock. So, yeah, by the time we got to the airport, maybe it was two. And I think the next plane was leaving at four o'clock. So here I am and I go on to the flight and I walk all the way to the back. Um, I just want to be by myself. Um, I intent, I was hoping that nobody would sit on the inside of me and I plan to do some lines on the way home and, uh, just looking forward to relaxing and, uh, and partying. And when I get to the back of the plane, there's a woman sitting there and she's on the inside. So, you know what? I just figured I can always go into the, in the restroom to do it. I was kind of thinking about doing it on the tray to pull the tray down that you eat. Um, but uh, I thought, okay, that might be a little too dangerous. Um, so we, I make it through. I walk onto the plane. I take a deep breath. I get into my seat. Nobody has said anything. Nobody wants to check me. And off we go. We take off. 
And once we're up, what a rule. It was just a sense of relief that I got through that. And so now I'm looking at the girl next to me and I'm like, wow, she's kind of cute. So I asked her a question or two. And then I said to her, do you party? And that was the beginning of <laughs> the last crazy part of this story. And she said, yes, by matter of fact, I do party. And I said, do you do Coke? And she says, yeah, I do. And I said, well, I, I have some if you'd like to kind of hang out and do some with me in the plane. She goes, yeah, let's do it. So I said, well, why don't you're all the way in the corner? Why don't you pull down your tray and we'll wait for drinks. And when the drinks go by, then I'll lay out some lines for us to do. So that's what we did. And uh, I don't know, within the first 45 minutes to an hour on the plane, and we're doing lines and hanging out and laughing and having fun. And then the next thing you know, she asked the stewardess or flight attendant, I guess stewardess was the old term, um, and asked the flight attendant for a blanket. I'm like, hmm, it's not cold. What does she need a blanket for? Well, she got the blanket for us. And after she did her next line, she went down underneath the blanket and I don't know if there's any young people listening to this, but uh, uh, what's the best way to do this or, or say this? I guess you could just figure out. She went underneath the blanket into my lap and um, proceeded to do some things. And I was like, this is the greatest flight in my life that this thing is just such an unbelievable adventure and nobody would believe it. And it continued to go like that. So when we landed, I was ready to say goodbye. And then all of a sudden, she tells me, she says, listen, I have a couple of things I want to tell you about. I said, okay, well, we're walking to get, get she's going to get luggage, but I'm, I'm just walking off the plane, but I'm walking alongside of her. She says, you know, I live here in New Jersey and I'm getting married next week. And I was looking for a last fling. So now, after I hear that, I'm like, oh, my God, she's engaged? And she just did this with me? And as much as I was excited and being um, not a chauvinistic male, but just being in a male's head that I just had oral sex with this girl and this incredible plane flight home, and then she's telling me she's engaged, which... I would have never done anything with somebody that was engaged. There, there was still some integrity that I had, and that would be one of the lines that I wasn't <laughs> – that wasn't a practice of mine to be with other women that were already taken. And um, so it really bothered me. But I was pretty high and had a bunch of drinks on the plane, so it didn't really bother me that much. So as we proceeded to get off the plane, I said, you know what? I have a car here. Why don't I drop you off and we could continue to party and do what we were doing on the plane? So she thought that was a good idea. And I got her very close to her house. I don't remember what town she lived in in Jersey. And she continued to do lines and some other activities. And at that point, sh I don't know, we must have been there for another 45 minutes. So it's late. It's pitch black out um, nighttime. And I said, I got to get back to Connecticut to see my friend. Joe's waiting for his, uh, his cocaine. So she asked me and she said, why don't we hook up next week? We'll meet in a kind of mid area. And I grew up in Yonkers, New York. So for me, Yonkers would be kind of a mid area between going to Jersey and being up in Connecticut. So she said, why don't I meet you at a hotel next week and I could have a last hurrah. And if I didn't have to think about it, I was OK. But once I heard that again, it just kind of turned my stomach. And so I told her no. And that was the last time I saw her. And that is the smuggling cocaine story. We'll wrap that up and we'll wrap the show up when we get back. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We will be right back. 
WikiWags brings harmony back into your home for male dogs and their owners. Inventor and entrepreneur Linda Jangula has created the disposable doggy diaper wraps made with the male dog in mind. The built-in wicking ability prevents rashing and other potential health issues for your dog. Each wrap comes in four sizes and has dual reattachable magic tabs for easy adjustments. And each size has a 7-inch logo strip for adjustability. So they are comfortable and easy to use. No more fuss, just leave the mess to us. Whether you're in or out, your dog will be free to run about. Stop cleaning and start enjoying your home, and you can even leave your dog alone. To order your WikiWags, visit wikiwags.com. Or to find out where to buy WikiWags in your town, visit mywikiwags.com and start enjoying having man's best friend around. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and I am your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I finished up the story that I wanted to share. Uh, It was a story about me smuggling cocaine from Miami back to New York after running out of suppliers um, who I was doing some helping to supply my friend Joe, who is a drug dealer, and uh, it was how I started doing it the first time. And uh, boy, it was while I was going through this, it was amazing. There were so many things that that I threw caution to the wind. I did so many crazy things, and fortunately, I'm here to tell you about them. Some of them I'm not proud of. A lot of them I'm embarrassed about, but you know what? At this point, I need to talk about them, and I need to tell you what's going on. We laugh at these stories. Us in recovery, we talk about these stories, and we say, you know what? Nobody's ever did this, or nobody's bad as me, or I've got a special story, I'm different. And what we find out when we work a program of recovery and we go to meetings and we, we share with others about what is going on, we find out that we are no different than anybody else, that there are people in the program that have already gone through embarrassing and shameful things that we did. And some of them have done worse things. And you know what? They have found recovery too. So it's important to understand that that was my life. I am responsible for it. I take total responsibility for all my consequences and things that I did in addiction. Um, I may have only been 37% responsible. Some relationships and things I did, I was 85% responsible. But you know what? I am not worried about placing the blame on anybody else. I am not worried that I need to be self-righteous and that you actually did something to me and you had this coming. I am in a position now And I believe that most people that have addictions and when they are dealing with things, even if it's justifiable anger, somebody that has an addiction problem and then is going to face justifiable anger is going to end up where 
that is not something that they want to deal with. It puts you at a risk, it puts you at a risk for relapse. And that's something that you want to avoid. So just, you know what, this is a, a hard thing to do. And it takes continual work and dedication. And, you know, not everybody is going to get sober. And, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of people that go into this program or try to find recovery or in court mandated things or sent away to rehab or you go to a rehab or an outpatient program because you're either you're going to lose your wife, you're going to lose your children, um, you're going to lose your job. But at the end of the day, the percentage of recovery in rehabs, my understanding is it is somewhere between three to five percent. And they said that to me when I was, I think it was my last re, last inpatient rehab. It was a place called The Meadows in Wickensburg, Arizona. To me, it is the greatest facility in the world and helped save my life, The Meadows. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of celebrities have gone there. I mean, they do incredible work. And uh, I was able to go there and I was able to share and open up and to do things differently where I... I came out from behind the mask and I became, it's where I learned and was able to come back and to find that I am now human again and I'm not living like an animal. So as you can tell, I love recovery. I'm here every Thursday to help you and you only live once. I feel that's a false statement. You live every single day. You only die once. Learn how to live your life every day. And that's why we're here to help you. The Alan Charles Show, every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And next week, we will have a wife that is going through a spouse with addiction. And she'll be here to share her story. He used to be an addict, now he's substance-free. Telling all about his crazy journey. This has been the Alan Charles Show with your host, Alan Charles. The views and opinions expressed by Alan Charles and guests on the Alan Charles Show are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the BBM Global Network or its affiliates. Even though Alan Charles thinks he's an expert at life, we urge you to think about acting on his advice. Even though he has been in recovery for 10 plus years, he is a bit of a mashugana. He's given us the real story, the Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, the Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory, the Alan Charles Show. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.